we're here to talk about data capacity and data culture and some of the thinking and the work that San Marcos has done in this particular area. And before we begin, I want to say that we are not experts in this area. We do not have it all figured out. Um, I wish we did, but you know, it's an iterative process. Uh, this is not a how-to. We're here to share some perspectives and some ideas and to hopefully facilitate a conversation that puts us all in a good frame of mind for the challenging but necessary work of assessing the changes associated with EO 1110. As Bianca mentioned, uh, last May, May 2017, Adam and I were both part of a campus team that attended the Student Success Network convening on using data to support student learning and success. Was anybody else at that meeting in this? I know someone was. I think Jeff was here. Yeah, Dr. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, good. So you haven't seen this before. <laughs> um, so at that meeting, the Student Success Network sent out a survey beforehand to all of the participants at the meeting, and they found that, uh, this is good news, 97% of respondents to that survey said that efforts to improve use of data to support student success were a high priority on their campuses. So, good. We have our priorities in the right place. However, they also found that only about half agreed that campuses had a strong culture of inquiry and that we regularly use data to inform key decisions at all levels. So this um, contrast really struck us because we felt that it was representative of our campus, that uh, we really believe in using data to support student success and in different areas of our campus, we may have a lot of data being used to inform decisions, but I wouldn't necessarily characterize what we have as a strong culture of inquiry across the entire campus. And so we felt that this was really an opportunity, and in fact, this was our jumping off point. We had thought a little bit about this before, but we really wanted to start thinking about this in earnest and do some intentional work in this particular area. So this is an overview of our plan for the next hour and 50 minutes or so. We're going to talk about our campus context, about who Adam and I are and why we spend time thinking about these particular issues quite a lot. We are also going to talk a little bit about the literature that we've consulted to inform our thinking in this particular area. We're going to talk about what it means to have a data culture or an assessment culture or a culture of inquiry. And then we are going to all, as a group, engage in some brainstorming around how to build data culture on our campuses and across the CSU system. We're going to come back and we will talk a little bit about a program that we have uh, launched on our campus um, specifically to address data culture, one thing that we're trying, as well as some other ideas that we have considered on our campus and things that we've heard about across the CSU from our sister campuses. And lastly, hopefully there's time, we have some time set aside for a little bit of a wrap up with your campus team so that you can maybe take some, idea, some of these ideas and concretize them. So, uh, I come from the Institutional Planning and Analysis Department on our campus. This is the Institutional Research Function. Um, many Institutional Research Functions are the same across the CSU, but some things are a little bit different. Uh, the big picture is we are a centralized function. We report into the President's Chief of Staff, so we're housed in the President's Division. We provide cross-campus data support. We have been working over the last several years to evolve from more of a compliance shop focused on accountability and official mandated reporting to more of a true decision support function, being more proactive, getting data out to more people on our campus so that they can use data for decision making. And with our uh, instructional and information technology services colleagues, our IT colleagues, we lead the Campus Decision Support Group, which is a collaborative working group around data and decision support. And we also lead data governance efforts on our campus, which is a burgeoning effort. We also do not have that all figured out, but we're working on it. Within institutional planning and analysis, I oversee our insight and analytics function. Um, the things that we focus on on my team are data visualization, self-service reporting. We use Tableau to make 
dashboards and data visualizations available to the campus community. We also do institutional surveys. We provide data in support of academic program review and assessment to a certain degree, although assessment itself, assessment of student learning is housed elsewhere on our campus. Uh, we also, when time allows, do particular analytic studies to dive a little bit deeper into certain issues or research questions. And I work very closely with the Office of Undergraduate Studies on our student success initiatives, such as Graduation Initiative 2025. So a lot of focus on using data, particularly for this issue of student success. And then more and more, uh, I spend time doing data-related professional development, outreach, and training for our campus. So um, I am from the Office of Undergraduate Studies. Uh, it's relatively new on our campus, um, only a little more than three years old, um, in charge of student success initiatives in general, um, including, again, the uh, graduation initiative. Uh, we, my particular role um, evolved kind of slowly um, over the course of uh, the, the existence of undergraduate studies as um, we started taking on a few more um, projects, including uh, our learning centers. So these are the academic support centers at the math lab and the writing center. Um, they, uh, those are units along with our uh, Office of First Year programs that are generating more and more and more data. And so uh, it was necessary to have a data analyst um, embedded in the department, sort of working as a conduit to IPNA, um, working with Cameron. Um, that I think is sort of a, a, a good uh, example of sort of a larger trend in higher education um, at CSU uh, across the entire, across the nation, um, we are collecting more and more and more and more data about our students, exponentially more data. Um, every single grade, every single interaction they have with every single member of our campus, we are recording and we continually collect more and more data about our students. Um, but uh, maybe every once in a while you add another person in your IR office, but as far as increasing capacity to actually do anything, to analyze this data, um, to, to review it at all, um, that might not be something that's increasing. Um, all right, are you really keeping up with the amount of data that you're generating as far as analytic capacity? Um, and so that is actually a question that I would like to ask you. Um, so this is, a, this is a call and response kind of thing. For show of hands here, uh, raise your hand if you feel that your campus has adequate capacity to collect and analyze and use data. Okay. There's see, a couple. I see two, and, and, I, and, my, and our campus is debating whether or not this is a trick question for, for our campus. <laughs> okay, so I think that it's especially interesting for the campuses who some people raised their hands and some people didn't. Um, uh, I would like to spend two minutes at your table discussing, okay? And so if you raised your hand, what's one thing that your campus does well with regard to data capacity? If you did not raise your hand, what is a barrier that you have to developing that kind of capacity? So you've got two minutes, and I will ask for volunteers once we're, once we're done. So. so. I'm so glad this is a thought-provoking yeah, conversation. I, I, thank, thank you for, for, for conversing. Okay, so CSU Fullerton. Okay, so you guys raise your hands. Or, some or at of least you one of you raise your hands uh, to uh, that that you do feel your campus has adequate capacity. So, what what's uh, what's something that your campus does well with regard to the capacity? We don't have a mic, do we? Okay. to really work closely, thank you, um, really work closely together with students they share in common, um, the, the notes um, that they share amongst advisors, and just being able to look more objectively as opposed to subjectively working with their students that they advise. So EABs have been a great tool for our advisors. Okay, excellent. So you have, you have a technology solution that helps, that, that helps you get to that. Yeah, that's good. Okay, uh, does anyone would like to volunteer at, at, for a barrier? To, to building capacity on your campus? No barriers. I guess our job is done. We're all we doing have, great. We have developed data culture. Okay. So this is San Jose State, I would say. One of the barriers we have is just people. So human beings to analyze the information. Okay, excellent. Human capacity to analyze it. Yes, definitely. Okay, thank you. Oh, we have one more volunteer. 
So I think our greatest barrier at Humboldt State is just not having a common vision of what it means to have a decision, or sorry, a data-informed decision-making culture. So does that mean that everybody gets access to all the data and they have self-service analytics? Do you have curated, golden, you know, dashboards that are the perfect thing ever? We just don't have a clear vision of, of how much data and how much information and at what levels we need to have that. Excellent. Good point. Neither do we. So we'll just throw that out there. Just out of time. We're not going to provide that. But OK, we can continue. <laughs> Sorry. So uh, the Student Success Network in their pre-meeting survey also asked, but they asked specifically about the IR office. And um, sort of similar to what we found here today, far fewer people agreed that the IR office has capacity to respond to requests for data and analysis in a timely manner, only about a third. And when asked about the business, biggest roadblock or barriers to consistent use of data on campuses, uh, we, had a, we selected a couple here. Our IR office needs more support so we can get ahead and be proactive instead of reactive. And data are mostly inaccessible or hidden behind interfaces that are very user unfriendly. Um, I really like the particular examples that we talked about because we talked about the issue of people and resources and we talked about sort of the interface problem and the accessibility problem and Fullerton highlighted their use of EAB of a software solution. These are really valid concerns, and as an IR person, I am absolutely never going to say, we don't need more support, we don't need more people. Um, but I do firmly believe that there is no magic number of IR people to tackle the particular issues that we are facing with the amount of data that we are collecting and the amount of opportunity we have to use data on our campuses. And software, can be absolutely fantastic, but it only goes so far, and it requires that human element, and it requires the common vision of how we're going to use that information. And this is something that pops up also in uh, writings by our professional association, the Association for Institutional Research. In their statement of aspirational practice, they highlight this issue that data are everywhere, and we have greater access than ever before to analytical tools and to software that helps us process and analyze these data. And what this means is that we have an opportunity for a wider array of higher education employees to be actively involved in converting data into decision support information, not just the IR office, right? How can we get everyone actively engaging with data? We are moving as a field, in many cases, from more of a service provider model, where institutional research is more accountability focused, more reactive, more responsive, perhaps only to high level constituents like the provost and mandatory reporting. And then if we have time, we respond to data requests from other folks across the institution to something a little bit more distributed and maybe a little bit more scary, maybe a little bit more disorganized while we figure out what to do with it, but something that involves more and more folks using data across the institution and sharing data, not just through IR, right? The previous model where IR was the data master, but also often the bottleneck. And now, how can IR be instead maybe a leader or a collaborator or a subject matter expert in this area, but elevate the other areas of the campus that have data capacity and have knowledge and expertise to bring to the table to have these data conversations? And this was also highlighted in the article that we read from NASPA and AIR and EDUCAUSE. Um, they really talk about an opportunity to transcend or remove organizational silos. How do we leverage the existing data capacity that we have on our campuses, not just in IR, and how do we also invest and grow that capacity on our campuses? So uh, we, we, in our continued literature review, we opened up a, a little wider. We started looking um, at some organizational literature, um, and we, we I think that uh, most people know Peter Senge and, and, and the learning organization and understanding a learning organization. We all strive um, to be uh, a learning organization in the original Senge definition of it. Um, we, we want to be uh, an organization made up of high performing teams full of creative people, innovative thinkers um, who are driven again by a strong and shared vision. Um, and I would say that we want this to be our organization, but this is also something that we ask our students to do and to be in their careers. 
um, we, we, we ask them to tie connections and we ask them to develop personal mastery. Um, we ask them to engage in systems thinking. And so it would only be fair for us to do the same. Um, one of the things I think that we've learned um, in, in our reading is building a learning organization, uh, this is a quote from you all here, building uh, a learning organization requires data. It requires access and ability uh, and willingness to look at data and understand it and understand how it works together. How we each generate, each of our units generates data and needs to share that with other units. Um, we use a lot of different words to describe sort of the same idea. That this is a thing that we want to be. We want to be a learning organization. We want to be a culture of inquiry and assessment culture. We want to be data driven or data informed. Uh, this is what we want to be, but how do we build it? Or if we, if we think we are in it now, how do we maintain it? How do we do that? Um, this again is a rhetor not a rhetorical question. We do not know the answer to that question. We are not going to provide it to you. We're here today to have a discussion to help you think about, to for frame this conversation. Um, and I think that one of the best places to start here is uh, what isn't a culture of inquiry? Um, what, are, what are the boundaries of a culture of inquiry? And, uh, we can sort of split across a culture of accountability and a culture of inquiry. So what is a culture of accountability? Um, in a culture of accountability, data are used to report. They are used to report results. You analyze data so that you can generate your grant report and you can check the box because that is the, okay, we have submitted our, uh, our grant for the year. Uh, however, in a culture of inquiry, data is used to inform decisions. Um, we will we'll talk a, a, in a bit about our, our uncomfortability with the term data driven. We like to can, we like to talk more about being data informed than data driven. Um, but uh, in a culture of inquiry, data are informing action. They provide context. They guide decision making. Um, in a culture of accountability, people want to see the good stuff. They want to see the positive data. They want to they want to ask, please show us how good we did, how well we did. Um, how successful were we in this thing that we did? Um, Inquiry-minded people know, though, they know that um, sometimes the best data is in the struggle, in failures, um, in quote-unquote negative data, stuff that may not look, make the institution or the unit or the organization look particularly good, but that's where the real learning comes from, is in, is in this quote-unquote negative data. Uh, culture of accountability tend to flatten complexity. Um, they tend to look for the easiest possible solution, or the, the silver bullet, or the smoking gun. Um, but in a culture of inquiry, we, we try to embrace complexity as much as we can. Um, we, uh, we are educational researchers, we're social scientists, even though, I'm sorry for the math faculty in here, but we are, we're all social scientists, we are educational researchers, and we have to understand that those numbers in that spreadsheet are people, they are students, they are human beings, they do not always act rationally, most of the time they do, um, but uh, maybe in, irrationally in a different frame. Um, they're, they're, they're human beings and they are not always easily aggregated. They are not always easily compressed into columns. Uh, and so uh, that does mean that we need to intentionally collect and meaningfully analyze qualitative data too. Um, and finally, uh, a culture of inquiry is data informed and data supported not just data supported. Um, data is used in a culture of accountability to support decisions. You make a decision and then you ask the IR office to find data that supports the decision that you made. Um, to justify. To justify. Data are used to justify decisions. Whereas in a culture of accountability. In a culture of inquiry. In a culture of inquiry, uh, the decisions that you make are data supported because they were informed by that data. The questions were asked before the decisions were made. So real quick for the next couple of minutes, um, I'd like to focus on the essential reason why we're here. We're supposed to be talking about EO 1110. Um, on the previous slide, we showed what was a clear dichotomy between um, a culture of accountability and a culture of inquiry. But obviously, that's not the way the world works. Your campus is not either one of those things or the other. It is somewhere in between. And it varies back and forth. And it's, it's a continuum, it's a scale, okay? Sometimes we get handed things that may not 
fit within our culture of inquiry that we have worked to build. Uh, you can work really hard to develop that culture, but sometimes things get handed down. Um, either they get handed down from something that may not be acting as a culture of inquiry itself, or maybe you just don't have time to be inquiry-minded about the thing that you've been handed. But I want you to think a little bit and ask yourself this question, just in your head, for 10 seconds. The conversations that you're having on your campus about EO 1110, you may, have, you, you may think that your campus is a culture of inquiry, but what, what are the conversations sounding like on your campus about EO 1110? Are you able to view them through a lens of inquiry? Or mostly are you viewing it through a lens of accountability? I'll take one breath. So you can think about that for a second. The point here I'm trying to make is that though we work really hard to develop our cultures, individual projects sometimes need to, need to be viewed through particular lenses. And you can ask yourself different questions about things through different lenses. If you were to ask yourself questions about EO 1110 through a lens of accountability, what you're basically asking is, did it work? We're going to do this thing. It's really hard. It requires a lot of curricular changes. It requires a lot of institutional change. Now we need to figure out whether or not it worked. Or um, from the point of view of the chancellor's office, please show us the extent to which it worked. Um, or possibly from the point of view of your faculty, please show us the extent to which it failed. Okay? But we are, we, we are asked to prove something. It's success or failure. But if you're looking at this through a lens of inquiry, you want to figure out what you can learn from it. This is a real thing that is happening on all of our campuses. This is a real big change that is happening to all of our students. We are making it happen to them. What can we learn from this year so that we can adapt for next year? And what can we learn from the next year to adapt for the year after that? These are the questions that we want to be asking ourselves through a lens of inquiry. How can we learn from this? And so my general idea here is that culture is not it's, it's Rome, you know, it's not built in a day. It's not something that, that we just decide one day that we have. We have a culture of inquiry, therefore everything will be viewed through a culture, through a lens of inquiry. Sometimes things aren't. But we can try to adapt our lens and ask the right questions to particular projects, like EO 1110. So as we work to build, as we work toward building, this data culture or this culture of inquiry, um, there are some questions that you may encounter, some questions that we have encountered. Adam mentioned previously this sort of um, tension between data-informed and data-driven, and most of the time we mean the same things when we say these words. But we prefer to use the term data-informed because data don't drive. On our campus, sometimes uh, we'll be in a committee meeting or a task force meeting and someone will say, we did X because the data were telling us. And in reality, uh, that sort of downplays the human element, right? We have to actively work to interpret and create meaningful data and to take action from those data. Um, the data don't just sort of exist somewhere, and as long as we can tap into them, they're going to point us in the right direction. It's all about our interpretation and all about the questions that we ask and the um, thoughts that we pursue, right, and how we use that information as a group. When you start to value using data for decision making, sometimes you get in this frame of mind that is, I need to load up on data. I need as much data as possible. I gotta throw everything in the kitchen sink at this grant submission, at this assessment project, because that's going to strengthen the argument that I'm making or the project that I'm engaged in. And I think that there is a myth of enough data, really, because it's not so much about the quantity of your data. It's about the quality of your data. It is about generating and asking meaningful questions. It is about whether or not the data you're collecting are accurate, are valid, are they measuring the things that you're trying to measure, and are they appropriate for the particular project or assessment effort that you're engaged in? Are they meaningful? Are they actionable? And what is the role of firsthand experience? You may encounter the fear 
that being data informed means our personal experiences or our professional expertise doesn't matter. And on the contrary, we feel very strongly that experience is essential to inspire and contextualize the data that we collect. That without experience, data are just numbers. And so we like to uh, put this quote into just about every presentation we do. Uh, information is data put into context. Only when information is combined with experience and judgment does it become knowledge. We need that firsthand experience. We need all of these different perspectives at the table to help bring the data to life and help us understand how to take action and how to learn from the things that we're doing. On our campus, uh, Adam and I have worked on this particular vision or this particular working definition of what a data culture looks like, what a culture of inquiry looks like. A collaborative campus environment driven by curiosity, inquiry, and learning, where quantitative and qualitative data are consistently used to inform decision-making processes. Um, so collaborative campus environment, right? Many people having seats at the table. This is not just the work of one data person or data team. This is the work of all of us. Driven by learning, wanting to understand through that lens of inquiry, what can we learn from this? What can we get out of this experience? Embracing both quantitative and qualitative data, even if it's a little bit messy, even if it's confusing. And ultimately, contributing to the goal of student success. We don't have a data culture because we just want to pat ourselves on the back and have a data culture. We're doing this because we want to make sure we're using that data in support of student success, ultimately. So this is what we've come up with. It's a little verbose. Um, but this is what we're striving toward. And now we want to ask you, how can we build a data culture? So this is the activity portion of our presentation. You have a number of post-its on your tables. We're going to ask you to brainstorm what we can do at the individual, campus, and system level to build a data culture. So at the individual level, this is what can you do personally to shift the way that you think about data and engage in that culture of inquiry, that lens of inquiry. This can also be how can you lead by example to help move just a little bit more in that direction of having this data culture. Uh, we also have campus posters specifically with your name on it, so those post-its can go up there. What can your campus do? What kinds of programs or activities or um, projects can you engage in? What kinds of professional development? What kinds of staffing? What are the things that your campus can do to move just a little bit closer? Maybe your campus is already doing things. Highlight those things. How can you maintain and sustain the pieces that you're already building on your campus? And lastly, at the system level, so we have individual and system up here. At the system level, this doesn't necessarily mean the chancellor's office. Right? This can mean the chancellor's office, but it also means us collectively as the CSU, how can we all build this culture in that really broad context? And it also means groups like the Student Success Network. What kinds of things, what kinds of opportunities can we create across campuses to build this kind of culture? So we're going to give you 15 minutes for just brainstorming. So if you the, the way the structure here, you're writing on a post-it. If you write an individual thing, come stick it up on the individual board. If you write something for your campus, stick it up on your campus board. If you write something for the system, put it on the system board. And after 15 minutes, we will spend some time organizing those posters. Okay? Go. <laughs> As we showed before, we, we went to our, uh, our professional association, the Association for Institutional, Institutional Research. Uh, and they're, they have a statement of aspirational research um, which talks uh, quite a bit about um, increasing analytic capacity uh, without adding a whole bunch of new people in IR. So uh, through professional development of everyone on campus um, across the institution. Uh, in particular, um, they talk about uh, this, this kind of professional development, again, not being limited to the IR function, to the, to the IR office itself, um, but again, throughout the university. Uh, what we should focus on uh, is developing data literacy um, across the campus. Uh, not necessarily 
uh, explicit technical skill, of, like you know how to run this particular analysis in SPSS or how to build this particular dashboard, but more how to interpret the results of these kinds of analyses. Um, uh, some foundational data literacy skills. Um, so we uh, came back and we worked on developing our data fellows program. Uh, We've already sort of talked about the goals we're trying to achieve, where we tried to, uh, we're, we're trying to, the larger goal here is to try to create a data culture on our campus. Um, but we want the participants specifically to work on foundational data literacy skills. Uh, we, um, we want to create a network of data literate people, of folks all across campus, uh, that could share their learning um, during the program together uh, as a cohort and also after the program um, as just sort of a distributed network of, of, of data literacy. Uh, one thing we thought was that was really important that we could help develop through this program was uh, common language around uh, a particular uh, data terms that we use on our campus a lot. Um, I think that one thing we'll, we, we, we use an example a lot is on our campus, people use the word retention. A lot of people use the word retention in a lot of different ways. Um, I think it would be in a good move forward if we could sort of try to agree on a common definition of retention. But there's more than just retention. We agree to a common set of definitions around first generation student or underrepresented minority student, these kinds of things that we throw around all the time and we all assume that we're talking about the same thing, but we may not be. Um, so developing a common language was one of our, our key goals there. And then finally, we want, we want everyone, all of our participants in this particular program to understand uh, that, that we all have a responsibility to collect and to share accurate, valid, and meaningful data. Um, that is what drives student, that, that is what is going to help inform the efforts uh, towards student success. We, we all know that we are each working uh, on a, uh, from a particular data source and we know that we can rely on that data. Um, this is a distributed, kind of a shared network. Uh, so uh, we put together a pilot um, of, of, of this program that we ran um, in the fall and the spring uh, of, this, of this last academic year. Uh, we, it was originally designed to be completed in one semester, but that's hard, so we, um, uh, the, the pilot actually drifted over into the spring. Um, we, we had 12, or our pilot cohort was 12 uh, people, uh, administration, faculty, and staff. Uh, we met uh, for seven sessions, about two hours each, uh, just about every three weeks or so. Uh, we were, we're fortunate on our campus uh, to have uh, a model that we can emulate, that we can point to, um, a, a thing called Campus Connect that the, uh, our Office of the President has been doing for about a decade, for a little over a decade, uh, where it, which is sort of a professional networking um, across units. Uh, we were able to kind of, while we were building this program, to say, it's just like Campus Connect. Um, so uh, that was really useful to us. We um, kind of cheated there a little bit. Uh, we think our pilot was actually pretty successful. Cameron will talk about um, uh, what, we, what we learned from it. Uh, we, we, we tried to approach it from a lens of inquiry and think about what we learned, not whether or not it was successful, but we think it was pretty successful anyway. Um, and uh, we're going to be running our uh, second cohort in the fall, and how many applications do we have already? Yesterday when I checked, we had 41. Okay. Which and we are not going to be bringing on 41 <laughs> people. <laughs> but we're very excited. There's been um, quite a bit of interest from folks at all different levels and across all different divisions at our institution, so we're really excited about this. Um, in terms of what we've learned, uh, there's a few key things that we wanted to highlight. One is that um, everyone is at different levels of data literacy, so it was really easy for us to come back from this student success network meeting and go, oh, we're going to cover the difference between quantitative and qualitative data, and we're going to talk about strategies for data storytelling, and we're going to talk about record level versus aggregate data, and we had this really awesome brainstorming session of all of these things that we were going to cover, and we did cover a lot of those things, but in developing the curriculum, what we realized was that um, we couldn't just do it in one way. We couldn't just um, say it as simply as maybe we think about it. We had to really work hard to figure out how to meet everyone where they were. Um, I need the thing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, to that end, you know, we had to work hard to make the lessons that we addressed relevant and actionable for everyone, not just something that seemed like a theoretical, abstract data concept, but something that people felt actually made sense for the work that they were doing in their roles and that they could actually take away. Um, and that was actually more of a challenge than we anticipated, but we are learning too. And we learned a lot from this. Um, one of the uh, 
themes that we labeled on the individual poster was something that we refer to as data empathy. And we feel that this effort has been really helpful for us as data people to engage in a little bit more data empathy. You know, there was a, there's a tendency sometimes when you're in this kind of role to say, why don't people just understand that that's not the type of data they need, this is the type of data they need, and how can we get people to think about this ahead of time? They need this information. And what we realized through engaging in these really intentional conversations with data users all across the institution was, um, wow, it's a lot more complicated than that. And we're learning um, to sort of take the perspective of the other folks across the institution and develop our data empathy and connect with them at a level that makes sense and allows us all to move forward together. So other ideas that we are aware of across the CSU or that um, we have considered on our campus, uh, there are a number of CSUs that have implemented team-based data fellows program. So ours is individual based. We're bringing a cohort of people from all across the institution together. Uh, these team based approaches are, for example, a particular college will send a group of maybe five people who are in different roles within that college to come and work on a particular project and engage in professional development around data. Um, so I've read about this at a number of different institutions. Long Beach is doing something like this. SDSU is doing something like this. Um, there's also a move toward using, this is getting back to this idea of leveraging existing analytic capacity on your campus, uh, this idea of using faculty fellows for institutional research. So bringing faculty on board to partner with institutional research or with other data folks across the institution and engage in educational research around a project that's of interest to that particular faculty member um, and of interest to the institution. And there's a number of different um, CSUs that are doing this. Uh, much of this work around using data for student success is starting to be done out of particular centers on campuses, like student success innovation centers that are sort of popping up and in partnership with its, uh, institutional research and those kinds of functions are generating more and more of these data and kind of building that partnership between IR and other folks across the institution. On our campus in the fall, actually all of next year, Adam will be leading a community of inquiry, practice, and action with faculty on our campus who are gonna be coming together for a, a learning and practice community around um, second year success, sophomore success. So really diving into the literature, doing some of their own research, and then developing some action plans for our campus. We also, in IR, have an opportunity to expand our use of workshops, demos, resources, allowing people to get their hands on the data, have access to people that they can ask questions of, how can we sort of bump up our level of training that we're offering folks. Cross-functional collaboration and connection, this is key. This is something we talked about earlier. How can we break down those silos, bring people together, make sure that the right folks are at the table and sharing information and sharing ideas, sharing expertise and not just data. Self-service reporting and analytics, this is something that a number of different CSUs have been really um, leading the way in. Fresno, I know Humboldt has done a lot using Tableau and building dashboards to get more engaging and visual data out there to create ad hoc reporting solutions so that folks can go in and filter for a particular population and really pursue a line of inquiry independently and not have to always just submit an ad hoc data request through IR. So we're really building out that capacity as well. And lastly, um, increasing institutional research and assessment representation on task forces and committees. Um, you know, making sure that these folks who have this particular data lens are at the table and can contribute to these conversations early enough to make sure that that's incorporated into the plan from day one and not just an afterthought. So how can we continue to build these cultures? And hopefully from the work that we've done, by the way, we did this activity with our data fellows on uh, the last day that we convened, and we got some really wonderful ideas from it for our campus as well that um, we're gonna be bringing to our next data fellow session. I hope that you got some ideas um, as well from this particular activity. Closing thoughts, so realistic expectations. 
As Adam said earlier, data culture was not built in a day or even one semester of a data fellows program. This is ongoing work. This is a long game that we're playing. Um, how do we just move forward a little bit each day? How do we lead from the middle and lead by example and bring that to our campuses um, and make, do that gradual work over time? And one size doesn't fit all. So, we have our Data Fellows program that we were able to sort of model after Campus Connect. We have um, certain groups on our campus that work because of the way organizationally we're set up. What works for your campus? What are the ideas that you can act upon to make progress? And on that note, we have time, right? Yes. Okay. <laughs> on that note, you have a handout in your folders. Um, that we would like to invite you for this last, is it 15 minutes? Yeah. For this last 15 minutes or so to talk amongst yourselves with your campus, select one idea that you've talked about or that you've generated or that you've heard about here today um, through this exercise that we engaged in and maybe just take some time to flesh it out with your group. Talk about who needs to be involved. Is there funding that you need to implement this type of idea? What would it actually look like? What are some next steps that you could ponder? So hopefully uh, you can just sort of get the gears turning on one or two specific ideas that you would like to further develop.